Good morning. Uh, I've just been briefing the Security Council on the humanitarian situation in northern Sri Lanka, uh, which, as you know, has deteriorated very severely uh, in the last few weeks and months because of the, um, the continuing fighting there and the way in which the government has been pushing the LTTE and the civilian population them into an increasingly small pocket. Uh, so there are extreme concerns about the safety of the civilians in that pocket, concerns about civilian casualties, concerns about humanitarian access to them and humanitarian relief supplies for them. Uh, that is the, uh, the top concern we have, uh, which is one of the main reasons I went there myself uh, last week to talk to the government about that uh, and to try to make sure that they were doing everything they could to protect the civilians there, to allow them to get help uh, and to, to prevent further civilian casualties. The other area of particular concern is the treatment of those who've escaped from this fighting and are therefore put in either transit centers in Vavunia, a town at the edge of the, uh, the formerly LTT-held area, uh, or are being moved progressively um, to a new camp being set up a few kilometers away. Um, uh, I visited those camps. Um, I was able to see for the conditions for myself and talk to a large number of people, uh, not only the IDPs themselves, but, but in some ways, more importantly, the people actually uh, doing the work, the uh, UN agencies and NGO humanitarian workers who have full access to those camps there about the conditions that they have there. Um, I think in general the physical conditions uh, in which they are being held are satisfactory, although there is a serious problem of overcrowding in some of the transit centers, which I hope will resolve soon. The biggest concern is about uh, lack of freedom of movement for the IDPs. The government have concerns about uh, security, which one can understand, um, but we made, I made clear to them while I was there that uh, having the military inside these camps um, and preventing the, the IDPs inside the camps from moving around, preventing access um, not by humanitarian agencies who do have free access, but access, for example, uh, by relatives from the outside, is not acceptable on any long-term basis, and they therefore need to move towards freedom of movement for the camps uh, and make sure that all the screening processes and so on are as tr transparent as they can be. So those are the main uh, areas of concern which I was briefing the Council about this morning, and I'm happy to answer your questions. John, I mean, you don't seem to sort of say there's any dire situation, a threat in terms of nutrition, sanitation. Is there a, a threat of any kind of disease or, or malnutrition? What is, what, how, is, how sort of in those kinds of terms would you describe the situation and what m might happen or is happening? Well, I think you need to distinguish two groups. So the, the group who is trapped uh, with the LTT in this rapidly shrinking pocket of land and in particular being squeezed into the, the so-called no-fire zone on the coast, and they, uh, I think, are increasingly vulnerable to disease, are increasingly vulnerable to nutrition problems and all, a lot of other problems because the supplies of food and clean water and proper shelter uh, are simply not there. Um, supplies are beginning to arrive uh, using uh, boats bringing it in because they're able to land on the beaches, but logistically it's quite difficult. It's difficult to get enough in. So I think there was genuine problems about their physical condition of that group, which, which is uh, the, the numbers of that group are unclear. There's something between 70,000 according to the government, 200,000 according to our own estimates, 300,000 plus according to Tamil groups. But whatever the number, uh, they're not only in grave danger because of the, the, sufficient, the, the casualties which are occurring on a daily basis, but also because of their physical conditions. I think the ones in the transit centers and the, the, the longer term camp uh, are, are being treated uh, reasonably well physically. They're exhausted for, from their ordeal. Um, but they, they have food, I think they have water. So I don't, I don't think those are, that is a problem for those. The problem for those people in those camps is more the freedom of movement issue and the, the, the armed nature of the camps. Well, just to clarify, the people mm. who are trapped, the, 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 the concerns you're talking about are some mm. things that might happen in the future that aren't really happening now in terms of the disease or outbreak of any kind of... Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, of a major outbreak of disease, but I think we've heard from those who are in with them. We don't have direct, direct access to those people, but those who are with them, uh, doctors who are there, that uh, indeed the, the, the incidence of disease uh, is increasing, uh, the usual kind of things that you get in these situations, diarrhea and so on. So there are problems which do need to be resolved by getting more food and medical supplies in there as soon as possible. And that's something I pressed on the government very hard. Uh, Doctors Without Borders put out a field report yesterday about mm -hmm. people that are trapped in the conflict zone and when they leave, they've been without food and water for some time, when they leave, getting actually bombed mm -hmm. and killed. Is your, I, I, I believe that you said that the government has stopped using heavy weapons. Is that, can you verify that? Well, it's not with... I'm afraid we can't verify that. They assured me at every level that they had virtually stopped using heavy weapons. Um, and that indeed they were taking more casualties as a result of that, but I can't verify that. 
uh, is simply unclear how far that's true. Uh, what it seems to be true is that the, is that the civilian casualties are continuing to, to occur. It's very hard to distinguish civilians from LTT cadres in some cases, but uh, I've talked about dozens a day being killed and more being injured, and I think that's still the case. So one follow-up. It was reported that during your trip that at least mm. in one instance in Vivunia that you used a government uh, minister, I guess, of, relocate, of resettlement as your translator. Is that, do you, did you feel comfortable with that? Some there raised thought that maybe you didn't get the full picture. And also, is UN money mm. going to be used for these camps in which people would be detained against their will? Uh, on the first point, uh, I mean, uh, this was a very carefully arranged government visit to the, to the uh, camps. Um, and therefore, the IDPs uh, to whom I spoke um, inevitably faced with two government ministers, a lot of people in uniform with guns, uh, television cameras. These were not very private conversations. Uh, different people translated for me at different times, and including on one occasion the Minister for Resettlement. Um, but, you know, I don't have any, you know, in this, these circumstances, you have to give me enough in, credit with enough intelligence and insight to know uh, when people are going to tell you the absolute truth and when they're not. Uh, but as, as I say, as well as talking to the IDPs themselves, I was able to talk um, to all the people who are working with them uh, and, and to pick up what their genuine concerns were. And their concerns, as I say, are really about freedom of movement and not about the treatment, of the, the physical treatment they're getting inside the camps. Uh, and the, the important point is that they, these should not be long-term camps. The government uh, assured me that they wanted to get people back to their villages of origin as soon as they possibly could. They made a public promise that 80% of them would get back to where they came from by the end of 2009, assuming the necessary demining could be then. They pointed to the example of the east, where they did manage to get people back very quickly. Uh, you know, we will have to monitor all these assurances very carefully to make sure they're in implemented in practice. On your visit to Colombia, mm. uh, what was your assessment of the situation of the internally displaced, and were you happy with the response of the government, the, how the government is uh, uh, working on this issue? I think the government has put in place a good legal framework for the internally displaced and has been devoting increasing resources to them. Uh, I think the resources devoted to them has increased from $40 million to $500 million in recent years. At the same time, the numbers are very great, even by the government's own figures, which is to some extent disputed. As you know, there are 2.6 million displaced people in Colombia, um, and it's, it's, it's clear that they still need more help. Uh, there are those who are not registered who need more help. Uh, so I was urging the government to, to, to give more help and to, uh, urging also the, the humanitarian community to do more in support of the government to make sure that they are properly treated because there are, there are some quite severe problems there, particularly for the minority communities, the Afro-Colombian community and the indigenous communities who are there. Is this your reaction to the uh, idea put forth by several members of the Security Council mm -hmm. that what happened today was a one-time only thing, that there is no future for Security Council involvement in this issue? Well, I think that's a matter for the Security Council. I'm sure the President of the Council will say something about that in a minute. But for the Secretary, mm -hmm. ben, uh, the Secretary General on Monday has called for a mm -hmm. suspension of fighting and for political discussions to bring about an end of the conflict. Mm -hmm. Is that the Secretary, the Secretary's position, that there should be political mm -hmm. before the end? Or I, I believe that you said in there, mm -hmm. after the fighting is over, then there should be political discussion. Uh, well, I think if the Secretary General said that, and I did say that, by definition that's the Secretariat's position. Um, what I have said is that uh, what is particularly important here is that if there is any chance of agreements for getting the civilian population out um, from the LTTE, then what's really important is that there should then be a temporary cessation of hostilities to allow them to leave safely, or a humanitarian corridor, or some combination of two. That's the crucial point. Then uh, there needs to be, uh, as soon as the fighting stops, in whatever way it stops, and I hope it stops as soon as possible, and you know, and frankly, I, I, I don't mind how it stops. Um, uh, my, my concern from a humanitarian point of view is that it should stop as quickly as possible. Then there needs to be, obviously, a political process, which is not part of my mandate, but those politi underlying political problems need to be addressed to make sure the conflict doesn't recur.